Welcome to Drunk on Games, where we choose drink play. If you're uh, rejoining us, we uh, are in day two of the Dragonhold City. And let's see if we can find more clues. Village, but yeah. It will one day be a city, I'm sure. <laughs> many, many generations. Depends later. on what we find out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we burned to the ground, one to two, we like it. <laughs> it's our over. Anyway. Three, four, three, two. You wake up the next morning a bit later than usual, greeted again by the smell of freshly baked bread and seasoned, seasoned meat. As you dress yourself, you can hear Miriam's voice above the other patrons coming from the common room. Because, of course. You step out of your room and head down to breakfast. Miriam, Braxton, and Sapphire are sitting together as usual, and a young gnome waves you over. You greet them and take your seat, serving yourself a plate of delicious looking food. Sartre has apparently asked Sapphire about the great oak in Evan Pie Forest. Oh, you must be talking about the Tree of Tales, answers Sapphire. The old oak has been there for a century. According to the story, the people of Dragonhold say that its benevolent spirit lives in the tree. Sapphire stops to take a drink of her tea before continuing. It is a custom in Dragonhold to tell your tales to the spirit. Whether spoken or written, they say you will be blessed with good fortune in the spirit if the spirit is moved by your story. Some of the villagers have taken a leaving gift to the spirit as well, in hopes of gaining its admiration, I suppose. Fascinating, says Braxton. Miriam frantically scribbles something on a piece of parchment and pockets it. When Braxton looks at her curiosity, curiously, Marianne says, just making a note to myself, Braxton raises an eyebrow and an almost imperceptible grin causes Sapphire's lip. You seriously get the, always get the hard reading questions. Yeah. It's pretty... Four <laughs> choices. Number one, ask Marianne and Braxton about their plans for the day. Two, well, ask Sapphire about the wooden trinket you found as far as the trinket. Three, Ask if there are any special events coming up. Four, finish your breakfast and prepare for the day ahead. Three, one. I don't remember them. <laughs> As, yeah. So I'm going to skip the we second one. We can't do this wooden trinket because yeah. we've already yeah. done that. Wait, three. Two. Oh, they said three. Three is our guess. So, oh, yeah. Wait, wait. Are you oh. talking about eat your food or are you talking about... No, 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 no. As if there are no. special events. The chronological three, yeah. yeah. Okay, special events. Sure. Uh, I believe it's still you. Yeah. Yeah, we're just, we're just, oh. we're just giving our suggestions. We're weighing in. We think, yeah. Okay. You're still the real deciding okay. factor. Okay, let's just check that three. Uh, ask it, uh, one seven nine three. Uh, three one seven nine three. Marianne and Braxton bustle themselves out the door for their day, answering about the renovation, renovation to the apothecary shop and how much work they still have to do. Market day is tomorrow, says Sapphire as she clears away your breakfast setting. The, there there will be plenty of activity on the market street then. And tomorrow night there's a bonfire at the village green. I think technically it's some sort of spirit festival day. But as far as I can tell, this is an excuse to meet and mingle. Hmm. So market day is tomorrow. So day three. Alright, we need to get and some gold by then. tomorrow evening. Yeah. Day three evening. She pauses and cocks her head. I suppose that means there's something special happening today, huh? Well, I'm sure you'll find something. You take Sapphire for breakfast and return to your room to retrieve what you'll need for the day ahead. It is so right. B6. Be smart. Oh, B6. Is it? Wait, is it? Yes. Uh, then this encounter is complete. Nice. Three, six. Yeah, three sixes already marked. Yeah, okay. So we got a lot of things we want to do tomorrow, apparently. So today is the council. I am interested to visit the orchard. 
the orchard. Yes, That's what you were interested in. Yeah. I'd really like to just go deal with this countess thing. I think we should do a countess and the apothecary shop this in the morning. Okay. I like that. I do like the idea of catching up with them on how renovations are going, so. Yeah. Any reason to pick one or the other? Because I'll do countess in, I guess. Countess stars. I don't mind considering yeah. I found the tree. Well, I convinced her. Which we convinced you to stick. Yeah. You did. You convinced <laughs> me to convince her. We did our work. We did our work. Persuasive service. Teamwork. You're good. No, it's just a persuasive service. Teamwork. Teamwork. Makes the cat work. Yes. <laughs> Fuck you. Here's <laughs> that. I like that. I hate you. But I will drink because I will drink. I'm uh, being a little pussy. Cat. I hate you. <laughs> That's my new drinking rule for today. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Proper for, for a cat. Yeah. Back to the Countess Inn. It's got the painted sign showing a woman's profile with the silver coronet. Adorning this two-story building, the ground floor is a pale red stone, while the upper story is a sprawling half timber repair. Hanging over the entrance is supposedly oh, supported by a thick, supposedly thick wooden post. <laughs> flower boxes filled with color for flowers are arranged between the supported beams. It is not our first time visiting. We've walked in and out because it was money. Day two. Low laughter spreads through the room. A silver-haired man throws a hand of painted cards on the table before him, groaning as another man chuckles and moves a wooden peg on a board marked with many holes. Ooh, sounds like you're playing your favorite game. Scrimmage. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thinking about that, I was like, it's good. <laughs> yeah, no, I was like, oh. The room is soon quiet once more as the men shuffle the cards and prepare to deal another hand. A small group of silver haired men and women ponder over a board of light and dark squares adorned with wooden playing pieces. Ooh, checkers. I'm liking this place. It's kind of a game. <laughs> a man half reads, half dozes by the fire. That's a comfy life. This room is filled with a vibrant, intense hush. Why wasn't this your age? What the heck? <laughs> Ursula sits in her usual seat beneath the painted tree, sipping tea from a silver cup. Get something to eat, spend money. <laughs> Deliver the letter to Ursula, if you can. <laughs> we can. Wait, K A? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, leave. Boy, I wonder what we'll do. Oh, let's deliver a letter to Ursula. It's like, mm. Yeah, I'm not feeling it today. Read 72... Yeah, I didn't really mean to be here. 7276. You offer the sealed envelope to Ursula. Okay, you did. And she begins to smile as soon as she sees the handwriting on the outside. Oh, Lady Grace, she breathes. Theo, you damn fool. Took you long enough. Lose the item. No, I mean, remove it from your sheet. She breaks the seal and spreads the letter on the table before her. Candle, girl, candle, she says, and her willowy daughter brings a candle in a silver holder, placing it on the table to cast its light on the letter. I used to love you, but no more. <laughs> Book, take it to him. <laughs> Ursula reads carefully, tears beating in the corner of her eyes. Then she stands, presses the letter to her heart, and closes her eyes. I have something for you. She says, and steps through a door, almost invisible, under the mural's paint. A moment later, she returns, holding a time-worn cloth doll that she cradles with obvious affection. And gold? Shh. <laughs> My mother made this doll for me when we first came to Dragon Hall. I had no friends then, you see, so she told me the doll would keep me from being lonely. And it has, for all these long years. She reaches out and places the doll in your hands. Its colors are fading, but its stitches still hold true. Something about its crooked face seems welcoming. <laughs> I don't need this anymore. I won't be lonely. No. I want you to have it. Maybe you can find some other poor lonely child in need, as you seem to be going about doing good deeds. You gain clock doll item R. Thank you. Mark story progress, K8. Progress. Progress. 
Mark one progress in heroism. Wow, we, we did that like three in a row. We're heroes. <laughs> Not yet. But we, we're working on it. She sighs and settles down again in her seat. I shall have to think about how to respond to Theo. It might be fitting to let him stew a week or two. But in the meantime, is there anything I could do for you? Uh, eat, get something to eat. God, fucking everyone wants to. She can't give us free food? After all that, we helped get you down. <laughs> no second breakfast? <laughs> second breakfast. Leave the Countess in. Time passes and the encounter is complete. So, who wants to go to the apothecary? Like, thank you. I will reward you by letting you pay money. <laughs> right? <laughs> hey, cloth doll. Oh, sorry. Cloth doll. You were given a cloth doll as so a thanks for delivering the letter to Ursula. She asks you to give it to someone who is in need of luck and love. The apothecary shop is a two-story building, featuring a large storefront and multiple back rooms. A show window fills nearly the entire front wall of the building, looking out toward the village green. If five or less time has passed today, read the entry below that corresponds to the current day. The walls of the apothecary shop are still darkened by soot and burnt wood, but you see the front door and its frame have been replaced. The boards that previously covered the front window have been replaced by a tarp. If zero or one time has passed today, read entry 4955. <laughs> I was looking at that earlier, I was looking until the one, I just saw that right before I read it, but oh god, thank you. It's <laughs> been exactly one time. All right. You hear Miriam's alto and Braxton's tenor voices talking as you approach, and find them in the front room. Tearing up damaged and burnt floorboards. Hello, calls Miriam when she sees you. I appear to have bought myself an unending job, which helps explain why the place was so cheap. Mm. Not unending, says Braxton. Why, we're done with the back room already. We're done with the tear down on the back room, mm. clarifies Mary. We still need to lay new floors and panel the walls, but that can wait. The front room is what the customers will see. She stands in the middle of the room, looking about. Actually, most of this floor can stay. I think we'll finish this up this morning. We can start laying new floor in this afternoon. I can offer to help with renovations, or leave Mary and Braxton to their work. I'm going to offer to help. Good. Read 6703. Uh, Maybe some... Not like... No. <laughs> now we're just going to get a heroism again. Friendship she bought it. She bought it cheap. <laughs> she has some extra left over. <laughs> Miriam seems uncertain. She wants to accept your help at first. Oh no! I mean, I can't pay you. Is everybody in this town cheap? <laughs> You're not paying me either, says Braxton, sitting with her legs dangling between the four joints. Consider the possibility that we're doing this because we like you. You set about tearing up floorboards and removing wall panels with Braxton while Miriam cleans trash and debris from the corners, meanwhile swapping stories of your various adventures. Mark one progress in physical training. Hmm. Everyone loses two stamina. You suck. Well, every time you Because I do work. I'm like, you <laughs> suck. Suck. You know, it'd be terrible. He physically trains us, he puts us to work, makes us lose stamina. What the heck is all this? It'd be terrible if it was another one where it's like, if you have athletics, only lose one stamina. Like, good thing it wasn't. Time yeah. passes. I don't think we have a story to top your exploits in Narek Hall, says Braxton. Sure we do, says Miriam. Remember that business with the circus fair? Oh. Miriam, Bra Braxton attempts to interrupt. And the clown? And the bear? And the naga tamer? Continues Miriam excitedly. We promised the monkey we wouldn't talk about it, says Braxton <laughs> in a hushed but stern tone. <laughs> oh, right. Never mind. No one stole anyone's pearls. Oh? She returns to cleaning, humming as she sweeps. <laughs> anyway, I think he was an ape. Uh, uh, wow. <laughs> what the? I like these encounters. If two or more time has passed today, read entry 3253. It has oh, now. It has now. It has now. Because you put us to work. I think we're ready to start laying new floor, says Braxton, wiping her hands clean on her egg. At lunch, says Miriam. You'll like it, I promise. 
Miriam vanishes into the back room and returns with an enormous basket covered with a red blanket. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that all for me? Asks Braxton with a laugh. Oh, hell no. (laughs) It's all for me. That's the idea, says Miriam. Shall we? So, options. Where are you going for lunch? See you back here after lunch. Or, see you later, encounter is complete. So, we can... Where are you going for lunch? I want food. (laughs) (laughs) You can't tease me like that! You suck! Where are we going for lunch? Because we're new and we want to check out new places. And I want to hang out with them, I agree. 2211. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. But give me food. We want you to treat us with our hard work, right? (laughs) You can't pay me. You just give me food, I'm fine. Marion was going to take me for a picnic at the Willow Grove, says Braxton, pausing in the doorway. It's said to be a lovely spot. It's very nice, says Miriam. Let's go. Would you care to join us? asks Braxton, as Miriam, behind her, stares at you in mute horror. What? Yes, says Miriam flatly. Please, join us. That would be lovely, she continues in a painfully monotone voice. Now I want to go. This encounter is complete. Damn. <laughs> okay, now I'm thinking about Willow Grove. <laughs> we should totally go. We should totally go. We're sure. mm-hmm. One, seven, We're gonna follow them to the Willow Grove, anyways. <laughs> One seven nine zero Willow Grove. The road leading south out of the village split around a large grove of willow and oak trees. The villagers seem to treat the grove as a sort of park or meeting spot. There are almost always children playing among the trees or families enjoying the sun and the breeze. If it is day two and exactly two to half past today. <laughs> just everyone? Just yelling. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that we followed you. We just here. Five, nine, five. We already want to check out the little girl. This gives us a good excuse. <laughs> yeah, we already want to check out the old trees. I was going to say, they did end the encounter without actually saying whether we could join them or not. Yeah. Exactly two voice. times. This is amazing. I'm so glad I turned in the letter first. <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing would have been moot if well, we went there first. 5955. Five, five. As you approach the Willow Grove, it seems that Braxton is sitting alone on a thick wool blanket beside a, beside a covered basket. But as you draw closer, you see that Miriam is sitting tucked up against her, cutting an apple into segments with a pen knife. Braxton leans down and murmurs Me. something in Miriam's ear, and that and the gnome laughs and crams an apple slice into Braxton's mouth. Braxton chews happily, enfolding Miriam in one arm and squeezing gently. Three options. Join them for lunch. Mm. Leave. Um, but, okay, leave, uh, sorry. Option one, join them for lunch. Option two, leave them to their meal. Uh, option three, follow the south road beyond the little road. Should we impose? But I do feel like we should leave them be. Should we impose or no, not? No, we should not impose. I think so. So, leave them be or follow the yellow brick road? There's no food in this. <laughs> I don't want to do yellow brick road. Or little road. So you want to follow the road? Adventures. On the road. 1370. The road. If a wagon track that is simply two ruts running through the grass can be called that, runs south out of Dragon Hole and marches past the mill, visible in the distance as a lean stone tower. Beyond the mill, hills pile up atop one another, purpling with distance as they reach towards the sky. Um, two options. Head to the mine to the south. Or return to the village. Oh, uh, head to the mine to the south requires story point B one is marked. Nope. All right, we're staying in <laughs> We don't. We don't lose any time. Nope. Yeah. We can go back. Go back and leave them be. I mean, that's actually what I had to say. <laughs> it goes back. Well, it isn't our choice. It isn't. Do it later. Village Hall. <laughs> Village but, but Hall. We can't do it later. Yeah, we literally can never do that again. 
<laughs> don't feel like we're pressuring you or anything. Yeah, no, no, we're not pressuring you. So, are you going to the village hall or going back? Uh, I'm going back. Okay. Right. What's the number again? Uh, it should be 1490. 1490. But I will not interrupt their lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can skip over reading and get back yeah. to the spot. Go, uh, uh, Dan says nothing about repeating two, sections. No, it says you can't repeat nine, benefits. It does not say you can't repeat sections. 48, 48, repeat yes. to their meal. All right, welcome back. Leave them to their meal. Where do you go? Back to this house. <laughs> you observe, you wave, you leave. And you can counter over. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was trying to find like sapphire in like the bushes watching them. Oh. Oh. That's what I'm expecting. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> you, you know, if nothing you? happens, can we come back and interrupt? <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready? No, he's going to go to the, the village hall. You ready? Yeah. You step back to leave Miriam and, ba and Braxton to their lunch and wander around the edge of the willow grove. You come across a herd of goats nosing through the bushes along the edge of the nearby road. As you approach, they bleat, blah, and prance away. It didn't say that. I just wanted to do it anyway. <laughs> It <laughs> prance away. The lead goat pauses and tastes the air, seeming to notice the picnic for the first time. Tail flicking, the goat starts trotting toward the center of the grove. If you do nothing about it, Mer Miriam and Braxton are going to have some unexpected guests. Oh, much <laughs> better. <laughs> you heard the goats away from the willow grove. Pull the goats away by force requires athletic skill, which you do not have, or endurance skill, which you do not have. I believe in this case it does check them again. Attack the goat and scare them away. <laughs> Ignore the goats and leave. Mm. Oh, wow. Three options to help prevent it. and You uh, can't do one of them. Two options that I'm considering. I'm not going to ignore them. Do I attack the goats to scare, scare them away, or herd the goats away from Willow Grove? Herd the Well, does herding require anything? Nope. Really? Herd the goats to let you I'm press thinking, them yeah. and hear you? I don't know whose goats these are. <laughs> they attack them. Yeah, by far? Yeah, they're probably I mean, in trouble. Yeah, they might be like sort of community goats kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, it's our lunch. Like a wine sound, okay. If it dies, we have to eat it. It's just an yeah. unfortunate thing. Are you cooking? Mm -hmm. I maybe, can. Maybe we might sure meet the one not cheap person. <laughs> I'm going to herd the goats away from the Willow Grove. You do your best to herd the goats away from the Willow Grove and it's back towards enough. the village green. The goats aren't terribly interested in complying, and if you attempt to get by you by using their horns, you each lose two stanima unless oh. you have survival skill. I got survival. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Where are you going? Ultimately, you nudge the goats out uh, of the grove. No, I don't. I don't. Oh, he doesn't have yep. none? No, because he has the right skill. <laughs> this is what it feels like to have athletics. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, you nudge the goats out of the grove and toward the market. A human woman with dusky skin and a sheepskin vest waves to you, striding down the market, market row. Hey yo, goats! Yep, you're there. Come along," she she says, and the goats happily trot over to her. A dog materializes behind the goats, barking enthusiastically at any that dare <laughs> to step out of line. Where did you find the devils? Asked the goatherd. Goat herd. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's one word. Okay. Goatherd. Goat goat herd. Right, monsters. This lot chewed right through their leads. <laughs> the woman thanks you. Then she and her dog lead the goats back up the market street toward the village green. Read entry 4525. Give me money! <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we came back, but still. <laughs> Where is all the money ever supposed to come from? Everyone keeps asking for it, and we're like, but we're poor. <laughs> Actually, we might not be poor. We might have started with money. You begin the game with 100 gold. Huh? What? See, we had money all along. We're just cheapskates. Or I kept it all. I could have. Uh, it, it was my fault I did those other things, though. <laughs> now I want to know what money unlocks. No. <laughs> had money all along. Okay. 
With the goats out of the way, you glance over at where Braxton and Miriam are picnicking to see Miriam down on her one knee. Oh. Her voice, probably louder than she intended, drifts across the grove toward you. You ground me. You keep me safe. And I don't mean with your sword. I'm a wanderer, Braxton. <laughs> My people are always looking to the future, always looking forward to what comes next. And I found it. It's you. You're my future, if you'll have me. Marion pause, pauses and swallows. Dame Braxton of Harmon, will you be my wife? Marion holds up a hand. Something small and sparkly catches the sunlight. Braxton hands hands go to her mouth before she finally chokes something out. Reaches down and scoops up the gnome into a fierce hug. Marion's doctor runs through the grove as they spin in a circle. Then Braxton crouches down and Miriam stands on tiptoe mm -hmm. in an effort to fasten a necklace around her fiancé's neck. Aww. You retreat as the happy couple cleans up from their date, tears in their eyes. Can I not come play them congratulatory music? Time passes. This encounter is complete. That's cute. There was nothing in the bar? Time. Oh. Time. No, I'm, su I'm surprised that that wasn't... You know, one of the story points. Right. Cool. Uh, I believe it was just remarking heroism. Five one hundred for you. The village hall is easily the largest building in town. A tall edifice of pale gray stone with peaked windows of glass at regular intervals. The main entrance is a pair of heavy oak doors standing at the top of a short but broad stone stair and flanked by a pair of columns. If five or less, time has passed today. Read the entry below. All right, that corresponds to our day. That's day two. A stout man with his thumbs hooked through a brightly colored sash is arguing with the town clerk. Surely you can find a space for me, he blusters. Why, well, I've never been so insulted. I'm sorry, sir, says the town clerk. An almost colorless man in a brown tunic. All the spots for tomorrow's market have already been claimed. I'm sure you can display your wares outside the market street, and you'll find plenty of business. The message board reinforces the clerk's mention of the market tomorrow, and also invites one and all to a village bonfire tomorrow night. There's a posting offering a shop for sale, slightly damaged, with the word sold written across it in bright red paint. I feel like I've been there. You notice the weather... I feel like I've worked there. <laughs> you notice the weather page that states a reward for a passing hero who can help with a goblin infestation. The hero is to report to Fior Brightmall at the smithy. If this is your first time visiting the location while it's open, read 3367. The town clerk coughs politely to catch your attention, then steps forward and introduces himself. Hello, he says. My name is Mar Marquess. I serve as the clerk for all village business. He, he smiles an anemic little smile and tugs on his, on his brown tunic. You just came into town with that orc woman, no? If story point F7 is marked. Oops. Nope. Nope. All right. Nice. 57. 57, 29. You confirm that, yes, you've just come into town. Good. Yes. Glad to hear it. How was your journey? Uneventful, I trust? You mentioned the bandits on the road and the clerk's eyes. Blast those bandits. I hope that I hope her ladyship doesn't does something about them and soon. He also mentioned the fallen trees blocking the road. When he cocks his head, oh yes, well we cannot have that. The road is our main source of trade without with the outside world. He shovels into a side office, piled high with ledgers and pamphlets and historical records, and flips through stacks of official-looking papers. Eventually, he finds one he likes and then scribbles out a missive. Then marks it with he with a heavy pewter seal. That will do, he says, tucking the document away. We must clear that road as soon as we can. The this encounter is complete. Don't you want to bet that F7 was if we cleared the road? And they would have just paid us a reward. We could have had money. More money. All right. What y'all want to do? What did they talk about? Did they Is it still? No, no, it's not the, the one we came to originally. That'd be the one on the left. Sir, your um, smithy is 5780. At the end of the market road stands a low building with a gray slate roof and a thick chimney. The smithy. 
The workshop portion of the building sports clap clapboard walls, easily open to let in cooler air when the furnace is in use, Oof. while a brownstone annex hosts what you presume are living quarters, offices, storage, and other necessities of the Smith trade. A polished, a polished silver hammer hangs from a wrought iron signpost outside the front door, inscribed with Dunwar characters. A bronze plaque is set into the wall with the same legend written in the common tongue, Fior Brightmall, Smith. If five or less time has passed today, read 7743. A hot wind blows around you as you duck into the workshop. The roar of the furnace is punctuated by loud clanging and the in and out breathing of the bellows. If this is your first time visiting this location while it's open, read 55792. The young dwarf man on the bellows pauses in his exertions, mopping his brow with a rag and staring at you with frank curiosity. The clanging continues for a few moments more until the smith puts down her hammer and leans back on her padded stool. What is it, Brill? She calls. The apprentice on the bellows points in your direction, and the smith twists to glance at you. Ah, she says, new customers. Come closer and let me have a look. She lifts a glowing hot piece of metal from her anvil with the aid of sturdy tongs and plunges it into a bucket of water at her side, and pulls it back out and sets the quenched work in progress aside. The smith is a sturdily built woman, simply dressed in a light white shirt and heavy leather smock. Her auburn hair is pulled back from her face in a tight bun, and her only ornament is a bright silver necklace around her neck with a subtle purple sheen. Fior Bright Mall, she says as you approach. Hand me my crutch, will you? You find a wooden crutch with a padded grip close by and offer it to her. She takes it and situates it, situates it under her left shoulder and swings herself on one good leg over to the edge of the workshop, away from the heat. Her right leg moves stiffly at her side. I know what you're thinking, she says. I must have some great story of battling a troll to a standstill to go with my injury. But I'm sad to say I was born like this. Sorry to disappoint. I am disappointed. I want to tell you tell. <laughs> she settles onto a carved wooden chair and lays her crutch inside. Welcome to my smithy. My apprentices and I can handle any work you need. Well, perhaps you'd like to browse my stock. I assure you, we bright malls are the finest smiths south of Dunwar Mountains. She grins and leans forward. Conspiration. Scum? Conspiratory. Yeah. I'm never, never good with that word. Conspirator. Tori. Conspiratorially. Conspiratorially. There we go. Sure. Close enough. That's it. And frankly, I'm better than most of those overproud duffers, too. Read entry 4422. Fior directs your attention to her stock room, which is directly adjoining the workshop and filled with useful items. Trivets and nails and horseshoes, of course, but also swords, daggers, coats of mail, a vicious looking warhammer and a wide selection of other implements of the adventure trade. Or I'm available for special commissions, of course, she adds, idly fondling her silver necklace. Well, Bozarth is. He's a journeyman. His rates are much more affordable than mine, she laughs. You purchase new equipment. It requires you each spend 25 gold. Contract Fjord to forge a magical sword. It requires a war room. <laughs> Item. Ask if there's anything you can do to help. Read entry nine triple eight. Son of a bitch. <laughs> I know what you want. <laughs> I know what you want. And it's physical work again, isn't it? I swear to God. Son of a bitch. We came over here for a question. <laughs> oh. God damn it. Let's go. <laughs> nine eighty eight. Nine triple eight. I'm just getting ready to... How are they always yours? <laughs> How are they always? He's drawn to them. There's a pattern. He picked it once, but the other two just kind of happened that way. You want to help? Fior asks, her eyebrows rising. Eyebrows rising. You understand that my apprentices actually pay me, right? She reaches for her crutch and stands. But I'm sure I could find something useful for you to do. If story, B1, if story point B1 is marked... Otherwise, read entry 5281. I'll tell you what would really happen, she says, stomping towards a rack of shelves and papers. There was a silver mine south of here, Ooh. past the Willow Grove. Ooh. I'd like to get it reopened, but there's a small goblin problem. Ooh. You wouldn't know any adventuring heroes who have some free time, would you? 
Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh my. Offer, offer to clear out the silver mine requires three or more fame. Oh. Three or one. I know. We can do it. Offer your assistance for simpler matters. Read entry 9407. Got back to this side again. Good. You were trying to make us do lots of hard work. Yeah. <laughs> we're heroes. We are famous. <laughs> Good news, Brill. Calls Fjord. You get to practice some metal work today. Our new friend here will be mining the forge. She escorts you to the forge and shows you where the coal is stored and how the bellows are operated, then leaves you to work while she attends to her apprentices. You soon find yourself stripped to the waist, sweating and throwing your entire body into the heavy bellows pump. Fior moves between her handful of apprentices, commenting on their work as they pound away at their anvils, pour molten steel into molds and quench glowing hot metal into heavy barrels of what smells like seawater. After a while, Fior approaches and offers you a clay cup of cold water. Thanks for the help, she says. My apprentices certainly appreciate it. As you gulp the life-giving water and dress yourself again, she counts out a small handful of silver coins and presses them to your palm. If you need more work later, come by. You each lose two stamina. You each gain ten gold. So that's forty. Each, yeah, forty. Time passes, the encounter is complete. Come on, guys, we're halfway through physical training. <laughs> also, down to like a regular number of 10. Like, dude, I only have four stamina left. <laughs> Same. Do you guys need a healing potion? <laughs> no, but a night's sleep won't even heal me. What else do we want to do in town today? Did, did time pass? Yes, time passed. Oh, okay. So it's now, evening. It is now evening. So, like, you know, marketplace is about tomorrow. Yeah, marketplace is about tomorrow. Uh, it's not pretty hard. Yeah, no, I don't know. If we go to market street today, there's going to be a lot of people trying to set up and stuff like that. That might. Oh, you mean more work? No, I'm almost no. out of stamina. You have skills. <sighs> we have not been to the bakery, and if we don't do it now, we don't do it. Because I'm assuming it's four or less for them. Much like the rest. I think about the bakery, too. Okay. I claim that one. Because I'm hungry. I don't have any bread to spread right now, but if you want to work, I can. <laughs> <laughs> if we use some more stamina that you don't have. Do you want to work? Hey, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> the bakery has a warm and cozy storefront, featuring a counter with various baked goods on display and a few tables and chairs for customers to enjoy their pastries. If five or less time has passed today, read the entry below corresponding. Day two. Ooh. A cat dozes in a sunbeam in the middle of the floor. Man, I'm jealous. As the door closes behind you, a silver bell tingles, and the cat startles awake and rushes away as if embarrassed to be found sleeping. <laughs> a voice with a dunoir lit lilt calls through the door to the kitchen. I don't know what that would sound like. Coming! Mm. This is your first time. Read. 3460. A muscular dwarf man comes oh I have that voice wrong. Comes bustling <laughs> through a door in the back wall. <laughs> no no, keep the voice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! The Smith was female, the baker smell. Our two, so, main, our two starting NPCs are a lesbian couple. <laughs> I think I think there's a trend going on here. This is an interesting town. So it comes bustling through the black back wall, carrying a wooden tray piled high with steaming pastries. The man has golden brown skin and chestnut hair. His beard is tied in mini braids, oh currently God. all bound together by a length of twine. Oh. He brushes flour off his hands and off the sturdy, practical apron he wears. Hello, he says. <laughs> Me name is Grisbeck Hearthstone. Um, this here be the Hearthstone Bakery. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. <laughs> He's killing me. Why did I do this? <laughs> I can't drink and laugh at the same time. <laughs> Grisbeck slides the pastries off his tray, placing each one carefully on a shelf beneath the counter, as he does. While he works, he continues to chat. I don't think I have seen you about here before. 
New in town, are you? You can you confirm that you are and introduce yourself. And he bobs his head. Well, pleased to meet you. Ain't that fun? <laughs> okay, there's a new voice. <laughs> Pick it right this you, time. You tell me. Nope, I don't know yet. It's a small voice. That's all I know. Oh, God. Male or female? What do we go for? Female. Male. Female. We'll go male. It's male. I'm betting a trick on this Construct. one. <laughs> I bet female. Uh, I'll be, I'll, I'll bet I'll against you. All right. It's non-binary. So we're, we're on girl this time. Was, was... Now I have to make it sound like a young version of what I just did. Damn it. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. I need a voice actor. Da! Called a small voice. Da! <laughs> Grisbeck smiles and lays one finger along his nose. Just a moment. He turns and opens the door to the back wall. I can't make them very different, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. A young, uh, Go ahead. a young dwarf girl Ooh. carrying a broad basket. Her hair is copper as compared to his warm brown, but the same golden brown skin. So, this is my daughter, Penny, he explains. <laughs> Mark story point and two. Story point! Story point! Right. So, wait, but just imagine if you did, like, a, a deep voice yeah, for deep the guy, voice. and I was like, alright, make the, like, daughter's voice somewhat <clears throat> like it, but smaller. Da! 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 Duh. Pleased to meet you, the girl says, as she stacks loaves of bread from within her basket on the counter above her head. Eight, eight? One, nope. No, no, we've been asked that one before. Uh, no. So otherwise, read 8125. Penny, says Grisbeck. <laughs> I'm be back into it. I'm losing it. Penny, you done plenty to help you dad out today. You should run and play with your friends now. Oh, damn, says the girl. I told you. What do you say if I got So bad. <laughs> just take a, take a swing, just to <laughs> wet in the throat. Uh, I need to train my bardic skills to do the voices better. It, it, it is a practice thing, for sure. <laughs> oh, there, says the girl. I told you. Oh, what use have I got for friends when I got the best dad south of the Dunmore Mountains? Aww. She smiles. But it, see, it seems a fragile sort of thing. And then she settles down under the window with a nilt old owl, with a knit owl whose head is attached only by a thread. Oof. Penny, says Grisbeck, what happened to Thagan Owl? Those boys tore him again. What? Says Penny, pa patting the owl more fully. Oh, that ain't right, sighs the baker. He tugs at his beard and clicks his tongue. They ought to know better than to do such a thing. He frowns, then shakes his head and turns his attention to you. What can I do you for? <laughs> you are right. The cloth gift is in there. First, get something to eat, spending money, that we now finally realize we have. <laughs> Offer to repair the doll if someone has craftsmanship. Give Penny a gift with that cloth doll. We're still technically in the or village. leave the bakery. Oh, what time we have to uh, We are in the village, yes. Yeah. But regardless, I'm going to give the doll because I've got it. And um, why not? I like her squeaky voice. Mm -hmm. or, 8178. Oh, it's right there. You crouch down and offer Ursula's doll to the dwarf girl. She creeps forward, taking the doll from you as if she thinks this is some crude joke. Offer oh, me? She says. Oh, thank you. I love her. She squeezes the doll tight, then lifts up her stuffed owl. Take it out. Make a new friend. Oh, does she have a name? She asks you. You lose the clock doll. Mark one progress in heroism. <laughs> Woo! We're fucking heroes. That is four in heroism. There's only eight. When will I get to fame? 
How did we finish all of that? <laughs> Max out heroes. But you're not famous. No, no, you're right. Uh, when your eighth progress has been made in heroism, you each gain an experience and your fame increases that one. Yep. Oh, okay. So, if we keep being heroes... One more time. We could be heroes. You tell her about Ursula and her mother and how the doll was her friend when she was lonely. Penny nods, drinking in your story. Oh, yes, she says. I'll call you Ursula then, she says to the doll. Oh, wait here. Good. Now I feel like I'm Mickey Mouse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you've been, you've been shooting. I can't. King of Scrapers. Oh, boy. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh boy. Oh. <laughs> now you're almost in Tokyo. Oh, yeah. Disney characters, man. Okay, what's that thing? Uh, so we have to wait here, she says, and rushes out the door. You hear her feet clattering up the stairs and then running about the boat. And soon she's back holding a whirling shell in her hand. Shell. I found this, she explains, slightly out of breath. Uh, when we first came to Dragon Ball, me dad, me. It's been me good luck charm, she nods. I want you to have it. You gain the polished shell, item J. Got item. <laughs> Mark story points, I7 and Q5. Story Ooh, points. Story points. points. <laughs> there you go. Finally getting them again from today. Time passes and this encounter is complete. Your turn. So my polished shell. This shiny round shell was given to you by Penny. When you clutch it near your ear, you can hear the whispers of the spirits. Yeah, I was thinking of doing Chatty Archer, uh, if we're going to stay in, too. Well, Chatty Archer barely just opened, so... The orchard? Yeah, a lot of things still want five or less, so... That's the orchard. Whew! <laughs> Those voices are hard! <laughs> well, we chose them. My fault, I shouldn't have assumed. <laughs> Three! One, one, two, zero, orchard. Hap hazard. Hazard. Rows of apple trees sprawl west and north of the village, heavy with sweet red fruit. The trees are twisted and only somewhat tame. Their older and thicker branches, propped up by wooden poles or ropes, here are there, here and there, in dangling charm, carefully placed monument or carved message adorns the tree. Five or less times have passed today. Barely. Barely. Two, four, four, seven. Workers walk. The rows of trees, some carrying sacks, others ladders, still others shears and saws. The orchard foreman, a human woman with skin as brown and wrinkled as an overwintered apple, approaches you. You here to pay your respects, or are you looking for work? Oh no. <laughs> I'm glad it's not you. <laughs> Four options. What do you mean, pay respects? Option two. Here to help with the harvest. Three. Came to visit the spirit. Four. Just have some girls. I know what you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do it. I'm thinking about the spirits. Spirits? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm curious about pay respects to as well. Me too. What do you mean, pay respects? That was my first one. Okay, but. Uh, nine, one, eight, four. The foreman nods. No one's working out on the western side of the orchard today. If you want some peace and quiet, she says. Then she leads you to your thoughts. If it's day four, uh, otherwise, three, one, two, zero. Three, one, two, zero. You walk among the trees, reading wooden placards, proclaiming names for days, days of death, and other details of those in tears in the orchard. It's a graveyard. Here and there, in the mento, dangles from a cord on a branch of rest or rest in the bowl of a tree. After a while, the calls and sounds of the orchard workers fade away. The drone of crickets and the singing of birds combine to make the grove feel like another world, a place you move from who and where you once were. You pause beneath an enormous tree, one twisted and gnarled with age. Here's a mound of recently turned earth between its roots and a silver cricket, fashioned to resemble two dragons pursuing one another Nail in the trunk of the tree. For a moment, you think you see a woman standing next to you, gazing sadly at the tree, just as you are. 
So when you turn your head, she is on. Mark one progress in spiritual meditation. Time passes, this in time complete. See, see, it's spiritual meditation. It kind of reminds you of, I don't know why, it reminds you of a betrayal. Um, oh, whenever you get those like trees, you just get creepy uh, stuff like that just happens. And you're like, the hate uh, tree, the okay. murder ground is called it. Ground. All right, back up. Yep. I'm also okay with going back to the Dunkin' Hog. So to have to spend money then? Yeah. Hey, we can spend money anywhere now. We have money. Drunken Hog. The Drunken Hog is marked by no sign save a discarded oak hog shed. The building is low and square. Its entrance sunken below the street and barred by a door, black with grime. Its windows are greasy wax paper. The entire building seems like it hasn't been cleaned since it was built. If five or more time has passed today, then read the corresponding book. Day two. An old human man is holding court by the hearth. His leg propped up on a stool. Ooh, is it a real leg? <laughs> As he gesticulates with a pipe. The leg, you see, is carved from wood and shit. That was right! <laughs> that is funny. What the fuck? I'm gonna call you pig. <laughs> I was guessing. So it's carved from wood, chipped and splintered in places. And the hand holding the pipe is missing two of its fingers. Wow, he is seeing better days. Meanwhile, a tall man and a gnome are having what seems to be an old argument at the bar. It's not our first time, so we read 3157. All the regulars seem to be in place. Thelga behind the bar. Reginald propped it up. Norman enduring Reginald's drunken rambling. The crowd in the drunken hog is as noisy and anonymous as ever. Shall we eat, drink, and engage? Or leave? Engage. 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 Minus 20 gold. Engage! 2038. You approach the bar and order refreshments. Thelga, the orc bartender, pours you a drink in a chipped wood cup and ladles out a helping of stew atop a slice of stale bread in a wooden trencher. Only the best, she says in a leaden voice. You each recover two stamina! Yeah! You're welcome! I ain't like that boy over there making us use it all the damn time. It's ridiculous. You know you like it. You eat and drink and be merry. And you find the food improves as you drink. <laughs> of course. Well, the crowd continues to argue and boast all around you. Read 7622. It's getting worried there. I was going to go to single digits. <laughs> I was in single digits. I am in single digits. Wait, fuck you! <laughs> <laughs> Wait, at least, at least sleep will recover all of mine finally. <laughs> We didn't pay for food, I'd be broken tomorrow. <laughs> At the bar, Reginald continues in his incoherent, inconsistent, and to the non existence of nose. Norman, for his part, seems to have put that argument aside in favor of trading boasts with an old human man, missing several of his fingers. The stories and rumors of the two of them swap steam more than simply improbable. Ooh. Listen to the rumors and stories. Brag about your own adventures. Don't get me wrong, I love bragging. Argue with Reginald that gnomes exist if there's a gnome race. Look for an excuse to start a tavern brawl. Yes. <laughs> or finish your meal alone. All right, I do not want to brawl. I know. <laughs> I you just recovered your stamina. I have persuasion yeah. and reasoning for a reason. I love a good argument. Okay. But I also love to boast. Say, <laughs> and I do enjoy listening to rumors. Fuck, these these three are all good. All right, what are y'all weighing in on? I like to argue on top uh, for the gnomes. Nah. This seems like the right opportunity to brag. Right. Oh. Two for brag, two for argue. So no listening. I'm gonna argue. I just like yeah arguing. for the gnomes. I like arguing. And I don't care about you. I know. Yeah. I just want him to look like an idiot. Because then they have an argument with, with him with a gnome. But when we gnome, prove yeah. it, he'll be sorry and he'll buy everyone a round of shots. I mean, 
But read you, 60, 27. You could brag. You could also get a round of shots. <laughs> I don't know that. You point out to Reginald that you are a gnome, and you do, in fact, exist. The tall man just shakes his head and laughs. Oh, come on. Did Norm put you up to this? Norman, buddy. You don't have to try to justify yourself to me. It's okay to be short. I am not short, says Norman, his chest swelling. I am a perfectly average height gnome. You affirm Norman's gnomishness and point out that Reginald is now conversing with more gnomes than orcs. Does he doubt the existence of orcs? Yeah. That's different, says Reginald. Everyone knows that we've fought all sorts of wars with the orcs, even if we're friends now. And I mean, look at her. No one is going to mistake Thelga for a human. No offense, Thelga. Offense taken, snarls Thelga, her tusk flashing. Oh, the old. There's never been a gnomish state, canard, moans Norman. We wander. We wanderer gnomes never have had a need for a nation of our own, and the burrower gnomes live all over, but they're hidden, you moron. <laughs> sure, they're hidden, laughs Reginald. After all, they're very small. You, you leave the conversation not at all certain that Reginald has been convinced, even in the face of overwhelming evidence. Mark one progress in social practice. Mia. Time passes. Then choices. Convince Reginald with your fists. <laughs> Find something else to occupy your time at the hog. Or leave the drunken hog. Fists or something else. I ain't leaving. This I feel is like, entertaining. I feel like something else will, will lead us back and we can find more choices. I mean, as, as I'm not opposed to a good fist fight. I don't think that's actually solves the situation at all. <laughs> fist fight I heard! <laughs> oh my gosh. 8492! Oh my god. I'm surprised you chose that one. I'm else. Honestly, I'm already here. Let's do it. That's our fight. <laughs> no, actually, it's his fight with his fist. Yep. <laughs> I'm here to instigate. <laughs> That's right. Teamwork. I need a good story to tell later. 8492. With a howl of frustration that sounds vaguely like, could a non-existent gnome do this? You launch yourself at Reginald and send him sprawling down the length of the bar. He staggers and spills Norman's drink all across the top of the bar. Norman slaps both hands on the bar top, leaps down to the floor. Let's do it, he says. No one beats up Reg but me. <laughs> he shucks oh, no. his vest, revealing a surprisingly well-muscled body, and tilts his head from side to side, cracking his neck. <laughs> fight! 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 roars the crowd. Oh Green entry. I think it's still his thing. Yeah. I'm really concerned. And the, the thing is, like, the gnome's not on our side. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're trying to make friends, not. Okay. You make this fight. You make friends out of this fights. Norman throws a punch. You step aside. Someone throws a broken wooden mug at the back of your head, and the next thing you know, the entire tavern is a riot. A fist oh and flying furniture. Reginald climbs on top of the bar and lays about himself with a stool. Norman launches himself at a woman with silver teeth and wrestles her into a headlock. Two men, one bald and wiry, the other thicker with gray hair, lunge at you, punching and spitting. Felga, the bartender, lifts a stout oaken rod and comes roaring around the bar, waving it above her head. Enough! She bellows. I'm trying to run a business here! <laughs> well, you each lose three stamina. You each lose an additional two stamina unless you have brawling or endurance. Oh my wow. god. Wow. Mark one progress in combat training. You're welcome for that early stamina. No, no, no. Combat training. No, I'm not physical training. Yeah. I at least had a real fight. Eventually, you. Norman, and a number of other belligerent patrons, each nursing bruises and sprains, find yourself forcibly ejected and hurled out into the streets of Dragonhold. The gnome brawler lies on his back in the mud of the street, chuckling to himself. 
Ah, he says, haven't had a good scrap like that since Riverwatch. Time passes. The encounter complete. The end of the day. <laughs> wow. What a way to end the day. And fisty guts. Yeah. When eight time has passed with day two. Read entry 9930. You return to your room for the night. Despite the comforts of the swan, you have a fitful rest, woken the night by thunder. Heavy rain pelts your windows, and strong winds rattle the shutters. Somehow you manage to fall asleep before dawn. You each recover three stamina. Just three. You each recover one skill. You each refresh your action token. Wow. This chapter of the story ends here. When you are ready to begin the next chapter, read entry 5322. <laughs> Julian. <laughs> You're damn welcome. <laughs> well, what a way to end it with a ball, brawl fight. Bar fight. Ended with a bang. Yep. Um, make sure to join us next time um, and hit that like and subscribe button. And please drink responsibly because we, we won't. won't. That's why we ended up in a fight. <laughs>